Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on M1 outputs. We will be discussing the output expansion capabilities of the M1 system and common applications such as alarms, strobes, garage doors, and even our new water shutoff valve. Our presenter today is Amy Strickland. Amy works in our tech support department and is the brain behind all of our webinars. Throughout the webinar, you can ask Amy questions, and to do so, you can type your question in the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen. We will get to as many questions as we can during the webinar, and any unanswered questions will be answered in the follow-up email that will be sent probably on Monday by Amy. So without further ado, I would like to pass this along to Amy. Thank you very much, Jesse, and thank you for spending some time with us here on your Friday. Um, we're going to dive into M1 outputs and uh, show you some things that you can do with outputs and familiarize you with the uh, hardware that's involved. Um, I do want to let you know that we are recording this webinar and we will provide a link to the webinar recording in the follow-up email as well as a copy of the presentation that you'll be seeing today. So let's just go ahead and get started here. I'm um, we'll start out just by show, you know, listing here some common uses for outputs. Um, as Jesse said, you can use those for alarm sirens and strobes, things like garage doors or gates. Um, they can be used in access control applications for things like door strikes or mag locks. Um, you can also use that for a water shutoff. Uh, we have our new water shutoff valve, which is the ELK WSV2, and we'll be you know, showing you how you can use an output to control that water shutoff valve from the M1. Um, you can also do things like LED indicators, sprinklers, pumps, um, pretty much anything that you're wanting to control through um, power, whether that be uh, you know, low current, thing, something like an LED, or using relays to switch higher current power to other devices um, like the ones that we've mentioned here. So let's start by talking about the outputs that you'll find on board. Um, what you see here in this picture is an M1 Gold. Um, so the M1 Gold has um, a couple special outputs. Um, those are going to be output 1 and output 2. Um, those have predetermined functions, so um, those are not outputs that you're going to be programming to control something like a, a water shutoff valve, but um, rather they're your voice siren outputs and also a supervised siren output. Um, so um, the EZ8 has output 2 but does not have output 1, so there are some similarities between the Gold and the EZ8 there. And um, as you can see there on the screen, output 1 is speakers only, keep the load between 4 and 16 ohms, and then output 2 is supervised. Um, it can be programmed for speakers or for self-contained sirens. If it's not used, you need to have a resistor across it, and a 2.2K is what you're looking at there. Um, so just want to hit those briefly, but what we're really going to spend some time today talking about is programmable outputs. Um, so on the main board. We have output 3, which is a dry contact form C relay, um, and you can program that through rules. And then we also have some voltage outputs on the J16 connector, um, which are outputs 7 through 16. Um, those are 12 volts DC, 50 milliamps, so they're not real high current, but you can use them for driving LEDs or um, triggering relays, that sort of thing. They are switched positive outputs, so your lead is your positive. There's a negative on that harness um, to make it easier for you to, to make connections, and you know, we're going to get into some specific examples as we go along here. Um, another thing that you can do, and we'll show you this uh, also, is to take the J16 connector and connect it to the M1RB, which is a relay board that converts some of those outputs to relays. Um, so we're going to go into that as well. Now again, what we're showing you here on the screen is the M1 Gold, um, but you do have very similar outputs on the M1 EZ8. One of the main things that I would want to point out that is different is the EZ8 voltage outputs on its J16 connector are only 10 milliamps. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're working with the EZ8. You don't have quite as much current available from those voltage outputs.
All right, now let's talk for a moment about your keypads. Um, there's an output available from our LCD keypads. That includes the M1KP, KPB, M1KP2, M1KP3, and the M1KP nav. Um, so the only keypad that really doesn't offer that is the very small LED arming station. Um, so you have that output available from your keypads, which can be handy um, you know, if you have something that you're wanting to control that's close to the keypad. The output number associated with the keypad is, is assigned by its address. So if your keypad address is 1, then that's going to be output 193. And that is a fixed value. Um, that is something that, uh, you know, it's just based on that address. And we have a, a table in the documentation for the keypads that outlines, you know, if it's, if it's address 2, then it's output 194, and so on. Um, so you can see here on the screen we have just a, a you know, small diagram there kind of showing you coming off of the keypad harness. The output is going to be your brown wire. Um, you're going to use your black wire as a common negative. So when you're hooking that up to maybe an LED or a relay, um, you, your brown is your positive and your black is going to be your common negative. Now, We've talked a little bit about the onboard outputs and also outputs available off of keypads, but you may have the need for more outputs or you may want to remotely locate some outputs. And for that, we have output expanders. Um, the output expander part number is the M1XOVR, and what that gives you is eight relay outputs and eight voltage outputs. Those voltage outputs are rated at 12 volts, 50 milliamps, so similar to the onboard outputs on the M1. Um, this output expander connects to the M1 data bus, so you can remotely locate it, and there are you know, some situations where that would be beneficial. And there are some dip switch settings on the output expander that sets its address, and its address determines which outputs it occupies. So if you set the output expander to address 2, you're going to have outputs 17 through 32. If you set it to address 3, you'll have outputs 33 through 48 so on. So that's how it determines what output numbers are associated with that expander based on the address. Now I had mentioned a moment ago the M1RB relay board. Um, we were talking about the voltage outputs on the main board and you may have need to convert those to relays. Um, the M1RB is, is great for that. You can also use it to convert the voltage outputs off of an output expander to relays. Um, so you can see here um, it's just a, a ribbon cable connection that's either going to go from J16 on the main board to your M1RB or from the J3 connector on your M1XOVR output expander to the M1RB. And it's going to give you eight relay outputs and there's LED indicators for each one. Um, now you'll notice here you got this little screw terminal and it has output 7 and 8. Those really only apply when you're connecting it to the main board. So it connects to the main board and converts outputs 9 through 16 to relays and those terminals are there to allow you to still access the voltage outputs from output 7 and output 8. And of course when you're connecting it to an M1XOVR output expander, those output numbers are again tied to that address. On the output expander, because you do have the eight relays and the eight voltage, um, the relays are, are going to occupy the, the top end. Um, so let's say you had that output expander set to address two. Your relays are going to be outputs 17 through 24. And so then your voltage outputs are going to start at 25 and go up from there. So that's how that works. Amy, I have a question. Uh, okay. Can the F1RB be used on the EZ8 due to the low current? Yes, it can. It can be used with that. It is designed to be capable of activating off of those lower current outputs. Perfect. Thank you so much.
Okay, so um, we have, we're going to go into some application examples and what my hope here is to show you, you know, how you could hook up different uh, things to different outputs, different types of outputs, um, and also show you some rules examples. Um, but I just want to double check with you, Jesse, before I get into these applications if there are any other questions about the hardware other than the one that you just asked. I do not have any more questions at this moment, but I do want to remind everybody that you can ask questions throughout the webinar, even if it's from um, previous slides. Um, so yes, thank you. All right, so to start out here, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the programming of outputs. Um, it, to program these outputs that we're talking about, you do need to have the Elk RP software. Um, they're not programmable from a keypad, um, so that's something that you want to keep in mind. As you're working in the Elk RP software, um, under automation, you have an outputs heading there, an outputs category. And the purpose of this outputs category is to allow you to name outputs, to determine whether or not they are shown on a user interface, and also to provide a voice description which is used by the telephone remote control feature of the M1 Gold. Now you can apply names to outputs 1 through 64. Outputs 65 and above and your outputs are available are up to 208. Um, so outputs 65 to 208 are not um, nameable. They're, they're going to retain their original output number for their name, but the first 64 outputs can be named, um, and again, those are you know the outputs that you would want to show on a user interface. You do need to select the show option. So when you are planning a job where you think you're going to have a lot of outputs, you need to keep in mind um, you know it's that first 64 that you can apply names to for your user interfaces. So you want to put the important things that your customer wants easy access to in those slots. Now you'll notice that I have a couple of outputs on this screen named, and that's for convenience of rule writing, but I have chosen not to show them because they should not be manually controlled, such as a strobe light. We only want that strobe light to activate based on the rules that we write in um, response to you know, an alarm event or something of that nature. The user really doesn't need to be able to go up to their keypad or from their smartphone and, and turn the strobe light on. Um, if they were to want that, of course, it's an option, but you know, that's an example of something where you may not want to um, show that, but you may still want to be able to name it for rules purposes. It, it shows, the name shows up in the rules, and that's convenient for making sure you know what, which output you're controlling. So aside from the output section, the rest of what you're doing with outputs as far as what they're going to do is going to be in the rules section. And so I'm going to show you a number of examples here. Um, we're going to start out with something relatively simple, which is um, this is particular example is a strobe light, but this example could also apply to a self-contained siren. And so you can see here I'm using output 3 from the main control, and we're providing positive power from the VOX terminal, which is on the left side of the board. We're feeding that into the common of output 3, and then we're going to connect the normally open of output 3 to the positive side of our strobe or our siren. The negative side of that strobe or siren is going to wire back into the negative terminal on the auxiliary power side of the board. And again, this could apply to a strobe or a siren. Now you may be wondering, as far as the siren is concerned, why would you want to use output 3 for a siren when you have output 1 and output 2 for that purpose, and that is a, you know, a, a good question. Um, one scenario where that may be something that you want to do is say you have a partitioned system, and you just want to have an individual um, siren response for those different areas. So you can use outputs to drive a self-contained siren um, so that you're only hearing that in the, that particular area. Because output 1 and output 2 are global outputs. They respond to alarms regardless of the area. So that's just one example where you may want to do that. Um, so you can see below the diagram we've got a couple of pretty straightforward rules for this particular example um, where basically whenever there's any kind of alarm, we're going to be turning 
output 3 on and when that alarm clears we turn output 3 off. Now we could specify as the example that I was just describing we could specify when there is a burglar alarm in area 1 um, or a burglar alarm in area 2 or it could be a fire alarm any different type of alarm that you want to trigger on um, so you can specify that in the in the rules. Our next example is going to be a garage door opener and this is a fairly common application that we run into but I do want to go ahead and, and just put out there as a caution we only recommend doing this with garage door openers that comply with the latest safety requirements. So you want to make sure that the garage door opener has um, safety features like automatic reversing or you know a photo eye that detects obstructions because since you you know are controlling this through the M1 you may not actually be able to see the garage door when you're controlling it. Um, you know maybe you're in an upper level of the building or maybe you're not even there and you're controlling it remotely to allow you know the UPS guy to slip a package in or because maybe you forgot to close it and you you know ask yourself, well, did I close the garage door? You can, you know, through a user interface, um, check the door and, and go ahead and close it. But for those reasons, it's very important that you have those safety mechanisms as part of the garage door opener that you're working with. If they don't have it, then we do not recommend doing this. But um, with that said, as you can see, we're basically just using a simple contact closure. Um, now we're looking at the M1RB. Um, in this case, you know, that's output 9, so that means that that M1RB is connected to the main board, and we're just using the normally open and common into the control input for the garage door opener. Um, now this is going to be either the garage door opener is going to have a separate input for something like this, or it may just have your push button input where you can have your button in your garage door to open and close the door. You can wire this in parallel with that. Um, so it just depends on the garage door opener as to how you know which terminal she connected to but again we're just doing simple contact closure so we're not really feeding any voltage into the relay we're just allowing it to um, make a connection when we turn it on and so I've got a couple of different examples here for your rules you may want to have an F key control the garage door um, and again if, as you see here in the rule you know we're whenever the F key is pressed on any keypad then we're turning output 9 on for two seconds we just need that momentary trigger for the garage door opener, basically simulating that button press is, is how you can look at it. We just need to turn that on for a couple seconds and that will activate the garage door opener. Um, we could also control that from a key fob, which is a, a common application. Um, you can see there we've written a rule for button three on the key fob to control the output. Um, we can also time it um, when the system is armed and so here's an example where you're going to see an output 100 mentioned there and I'm going to explain that a little bit further at the end as far as what that's doing but that's what we consider a phantom output and we're using that as a timer in this case so we're basically saying when the system's armed away we want to wait five minutes and so that's what that output 100 is doing for us and then when that output turns off five minutes later we're checking is the system still armed in away mode is the door open and if it is then we're going to issue that command to output 9 to close it. And I, I just want to pause for a moment here and to see if there are any questions about you know these couple of applications that I've went over before I move on to the next one. I currently do not have any questions um, on the current slides. But I do have one um, from the beginning of the presentation. Uh, Jeff asked, how much current are the relay contacts capable of? They're rated up to 4 amps. Thank you so much, Amy. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you.
All right, so now let's talk about water shutoff valves, and this is something that we're really excited about. We have a new water shutoff valve, which is the Elk WSV2. Um, it's a very <laughs> nice, very nice water shutoff valve. It has a, a manual um, override. It is uh, made in America, two-year warranty, um, and it's just a really really nice product. So that's something if you haven't checked that out, we would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, it's it's a really good product and we're we're really excited about it as you can tell. Jessie's she's all about some water shut off valves. So um, I am uh, all about the water shut off valve. <laughs> <laughs> So let's uh, talk about how we can use the M1 to control the water shutoff valve. Um, the water shutoff valve has a um, harness that comes off of it, and um, there are some leads on that harness. We're going to talk about three of the four of those leads, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you the one that I've ex excluded from this hookup diagram is the green lead, which is a status indicator. Um, we're not going to be using that in this particular application with the M1, so I did omit that particular wire from my diagram. But um, let's talk about the connections that are required to operate the valve. Um, it has a black lead, which is your common negative, and then a red lead for closing the valve, a white lead for opening the valve. It operates off of 12 volts DC, and it takes just depending on the circumstances, it takes anywhere from around 800 milliamps to you know around two amps to operate it. Um, so we recommend having at least like a two amp power supply for that. Um, so you can see here in my diagram, I've got my 12 volt DC power supply, and I'm going to be using output 10 off of the M1RB to switch power to the particular lead that whether I want to open or close the valve. So you can see I'm bringing the positive from my power supply into the common on output 10 and the negative of the water shutoff valve is going to go straight to the negative of that power supply. And in this case we have this wired in what we would call a fail safe mode. Um, so the open valve is going to normally open, the um, valve close lead is going to normally close. So if this relay is turned off and the power is still there, the valve will go ahead and close. So that's going to be fail safe. Now you can wire it the other way if you want it to remain open if, in the event that the relay is turned off, um, say from the M1 being powered down or, or something of that nature. But um, the example here we're showing the fail safe option, which is what you'll see in our documentation. But Again, you can do it the other way. Um, so what we're looking at here in our rules is whenever there's a water alarm, and so we're looking at having water sensors in various places um, connected to zones on the M1, whether those be um, you know, hardwired or I think there are some wireless options available from some of our, um, whether that be the, the GE or the, the Honeywell. Um, we currently in our two-way wireless do not offer a water sensor but I, I do believe that's something that is being considered as an addition to that line. So at some point we may have that, but again, it could be wa uh, hardwired or one of the other wireless options. Those are connected to inputs on the system and defined as water alarms. And so when that water alarm is triggered, in this case we are turning the output 10 off. And by turning it off, that is applying voltage from the normally open, or excuse me, from, from common to the normally closed to close the valve. And you can see we're also making some notifications here. So we're dialing the owner's number and leaving them a message and also sending them an email so that they're aware of this problem. Um, so that's uh, something that you can do. And you can see in that rule we have those stacked thins. If, um, rules or something you're not real familiar with, you can have you know multiple thins in a rule and that's an example of why, why you might want to do that. Another thing that you can consider when you're using the water shutoff valve is you know if you're not there, you can just go ahead and turn the water off. Now that could be just on an armed away if you want to do that daily and, and that's certainly something that you can consider. Um, I've shown here an example if uh, the system is armed to vacation mode, we're going to go ahead and shut the water off. And that's something that uh, you know you can explain to your customers the importance of that because a lot of times with uh, the insurance, if the problem has existed for a certain period of time, um, they consider it negligent and they may not cover it. So it's a good idea to cut your water off if you're going to be gone for 
you know, several days so that you don't run into those kind of problems. And this is something where you just armed a vacation mode and it does it for you because, you know, when you're going on vacation, you there are a hundred things that you have to remember and this uh, will just make one of those something that you don't have to worry about. We also have an example here showing the F5 key being used to toggle it. So you have a manual um, way to control the valve from your keypad. Now that can be handy just if you want to manually shut the water off or also as a reset um, if you do have a water alarm you know it's going to cut the water off. You don't necessarily want to cut the water back on as soon as you come in and clear that alarm because the situation that caused the leak has probably not been addressed at that point. So using the F key gives you a manual way from the keypad to turn the water back on. Um, and you can see there we're toggling so each press of that key is going to change the state of that output. So it, it acts as an on off button in that case. But then, of course, with this new water shutoff valve, you've also got the manual override handle, so a number of options there, but this is a convenient way your customer can do that from their keypad. Amy, before we move on, I have a couple of questions about the water shutoff valve. Okay. Um, the first one is, to control the ELK WSV2, is a momentary contact or sustained contact required? In this case, we're doing a sustained contact, and that's why we're able to use one relay to open and close the valve. It has a built-in um, limit switch that tells it when to stop turning, when it's a, a either fully open or fully closed. So you can um, hook it up as we've shown here, and the voltage is going to be present on one or the other terminal all the time, and that's fine. It, that's the way it's designed to be used. Now it takes roughly, um, I think it's like two to four seconds for it to go from fully open, fully closed, or vice versa. So I mean it's possible for you to write your rule to time it that way, but it's just not necessary and it adds to a lot more complication. Um, with the M1 we would recommend doing it the way shown here. And then in this figure um, that you have, you have the WSV2 connecting to output 10. Can you put it in output 9 or output 11? Oh sure, absolutely, you sure can. Um, any relay off of the M1 can control this particular valve. Um, I'm just showing output 10 in this example. I, th I used output 9 in the previous example, so I'm just you know showing it hooked to a different output. Um, but yeah, any relay output off the board, whether that be output 3 off the main board if you're not using it for anything else, any of the relays off of the M1RB, or any of the relays off of an output expander. Okay, and then how much current does the valve draw when it is in steady state? Steady state, now I'm, uh, is that to mean when it is um, not in operation, it's not moving? Right. Um, it, the current draw there is, is nominal, there's, there's very little current draw involved um, in it just being in a, you know, a standby type mode, but the current draw varies um, depending on you know, the torque needed to turn the valve, that could be very based on water pressure and also how long it's been since the last time it was open because minerals do, you know, collect on that stainless steel and so if it's been a very long time since it's opened, it does require more tor torque to open it, which relate, you know, translates to higher current draw, but um, it is, you know, very, uh, very uh, strong solid valve and, and can definitely handle the higher pressure and also, um, you know, those longer periods of, of standby, but the standby current draw is nominal. All right, thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you for the, the uh, questions. Keep them coming. All right, now let's talk about um, something like an LED indicator. And so what I've got here is a, an LED status panel that has a red LED and a green LED. And maybe this is something that you want to have outside um, near a, an access keypad or, or just as a, a visual indicator for your customer in, in you know, some other location. But what we're wanting to do with those LEDs is to indicate whether or not the system is armed or if it's ready to arm or if there is an active alarm. Um, so the desired outcome is that when the system is ready to arm, the green LED comes on. Um, if it's armed, then the red LED is on, and if there is an alarm, the red LED 
will blink. Um, so you can see here what I'm using is an M1X OVR, so this is an output expander, and again maybe this is one of those situations where you've already used a bunch of outputs, or maybe you just need to remotely locate this from the main control, so an output expander is a good choice. And instead of using the relays on the output expander, we're actually going to go ahead and use some of these voltage outputs because you know, 50 milliamps is enough to drive our LEDs here. Um, so we're using the um, ribbon cable harness that comes with the output expander to connect to J3, which provides us with the um, different outputs. And they're numbered here, 1 through 8, 9 through 16. Those numbers apply to, uh, they're relative to the board. So whereas you can see here, um, we're using what is labeled 9 and 10, those actually translate to outputs 25 and 26 if this M1X OVR is set to address 2. So um, if that is confusing to you, please let me know because I can see how it, it may be. But uh, you know, so all based on the address of this device as to what the output numbers are. And so you can see here I actually have a number of rules to achieve the desired operation because we are doing a number of things with these LEDs. So if the system is armed, you know, we write a rule for that. We're going to turn the armed LED, which is going to be connected to output 25, the gray wire. We're going to turn that on and we're going to go ahead and turn um, output 26, which is the green LED, off. Um, and then we also have another rule here that says whenever it becomes ready and it's disarmed, then we want to turn the red LED off, the green LED on. Now I did need to specify that it's disarmed here because it is possible if you don't do that for that green LED to come on while the system is armed and that could be confusing. So that's why I made that um, specification in the AND statement. Um, if the system it becomes not ready, um, then we're going to go ahead and turn the green LED off. And so looking here at the, the top row here in the second column, we're saying whenever every two seconds, so we're just you know, repeatedly checking if there's an active alarm, then we're turning the red LED on for one second. So what happens when you have an alarm, every two seconds the system checks and it turns the LED on for one second. So you end up with a blink pattern of one second on, one second off while there is an active alarm. So it's a, a pretty, uh, you know, quick clean rule to achieve that blinking um, indicator of an alarm having occurred. Um, now as I was working through this I did find that I needed to write this rule which you can see looks similar to our rule here but our whenever and our and are kind of switched around so we're basically saying whenever the system is disarmed if it is ready to arm at that time then we want to go ahead and turn the red LED off and the green LED back on and um, that is so that when you disarm the system whether that be after an alarm or at just when you've disarmed the system if there wasn't an alarm you can go ahead and get that green LED back in sync with the system. Amy, uh, for the LED indicators, are resistors necessary or not? Um, there, with, with the diagram that we have here, we're not showing the resistors. Um, they're not necessary with the particular LEDs that are, you know, pictured in the, in this particular application. Um, in most cases, you should not need resistors. If uh, there's something particular about the LED that you're using that requires it, you want to check the documentation. But you know, with the, the things that I've got hooked up in my office and the stuff that I've been using, um, it wasn't wasn't necessary. All right, thank you. All right, so now we're going to talk about something a, a, a little unusual here, but this is something that I get uh, phone calls about occasionally, and I, I, I feel like it was a, a good way to um, show a, you know, a little bit more of an unusual application for the output expanders or the outputs on the system. Um, we have zone temperature sensors that can be connected to any of the main board zones, um, so you could have up to 16 of those and they provide numeric temperature data to the control. So they tell the control it's, you know, this temperature, it's, you know, 72 degrees or it's 40 degrees or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, 
those sensors are designed to provide that numeric data, but they're not designed to create an alarm directly. But we do have some situations where people have wanted to be able to create an alarm based on the reading of that temperature sensor. So to do that, you actually have to write rules to trigger an output to, that is then tied back into a different zone on the panel. And so you can see in my example here, I have my temperature sensor connected to zone 14, and then I've got my output connected to zone 13. And I took a, a couple of quick screenshots here just to show you how I have these two zones set up. Um, one I'm named temperature alarm, and I actually have that set up as a definition 19, which is a freeze alarm, and it's end of line supervised. And then my zone 14, um, which is the actual temperature sensor, is defined as a 33. And when you define a zone as 33, the only type that you're allowed to select is 2, which is normally open. So that's what you need to have for that. So zone 14 is going to tell the temperature, uh, the temperature of that area. And then if it's within a range that is unacceptable, then we're going to turn on an output, which will then trigger zone 13 to create an alarm. Um, so you can see from the diagram how we've got that hooked up, and I'm using um, output 2 off of an M1 XOVR. Uh, again, assuming that that address is set to 2, that's going to be output number 18. Um, so we're looking every 30 minutes to see what the temperature is at zone 14, and if it's less than 40 degrees, then we want to go ahead and create an alarm um, so that we can get an alert for this particular situation. So we're turning output 18 on, which is then going to trigger zone 13 to go into alarm. And you can see in the second rule, it, that's how we're resetting that. Now you'll notice that I did put a, you know, a five degree gap between turning the output on, turning the output off. Um, the reason that I did that is so that you don't have this like constant back and forth of that um, zone being triggered um, as the temperature makes smaller fluctuations. So we're saying if it gets below 40, we want to turn it on, create the alarm. We don't want to reset that zone until the temperature gets back up to 45. Um, so we can, you know, in, in this scenario, we feel like that means that the situation has been taken care of. And so again, just simply turning that output on and off in those conditions. And you can adjust the frequency and once you look at the temperature, um, again, here we're doing every 30 minutes, but you could do that more or less frequently depending on your application. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about is what we refer to as a phantom output. And a phantom output is an output that doesn't physically exist. It doesn't actually control any physical piece of hardware. But we manipulate its state using rules to achieve things that we want to happen in our rules. Um, so this is something that you may run into. Um, and again, it's, it's not really a physical output, but the system does keep up with the state of all of the outputs, whether they exist or not. And again, you can have up to 208 outputs on the system, so you've got a lot of uh, outputs to work with there. Um, so I've got a couple of examples where a phantom output's being used. Um, I showed you one earlier with the garage door where we were using that output 100 as a uh, five-minute timer. So that's one example, but I've got a couple other ones here. Um, Let's say that uh, you want to frequently check the temperature of a freezer. Maybe this is a restaurant application, and it's very important that the freezer you know, stay operating, and you want to know that right away if there's a problem with the freezer so that you can take care of it. Um, so we're checking every five minutes um, to see what the temperature is. And again, looking at zone 15 here, that's going to be one of our zone temperature sensors. Um, we're saying if that goes above 32 degrees, then we want to know that. Um, and of course, look, we're sending an email notification to the manager. Um, but that manager doesn't necessarily want to get that every five minutes. And if you write it just whenever every five minutes and temperature is greater than 32, then send email, it's, gonna, it's possible that you could have a situation where that email just gets sent every five minutes. And that may be considered a nuisance by your customer. Um, so what you can do is use a phantom output to 
basically we're still checking it frequently, but if that notification has been made, then we're going to hold off for, in this case, 45 minutes before we would allow that notification to occur again. Um, so by checking output 102, in this case, um, in the AND statement, it must be off. Um, then we can send our notification, and then we turn that output 102 on for 45 minutes. And so what that means is even though we're still checking the temperature every five minutes, it's going to be 45 minutes from that first notification before another notification would be sent. So that kind of helps you suppress that uh, runaway condition without having to let it be you know, so long before you check the temperature again. Because you know, 45 minutes from the get-go may be too long, you know, foods starting to thaw, your inventory is damaged, that kind of thing. So this is a solution for that using a phantom output. Another common application for phantom outputs is related to F keys or key fob buttons. Um, so if you have something that you want to do with the key fob button um, or an F key, and say you want it to be an on-off kind of thing, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, in this case, we want to have an F key that's going to turn the voice on and off. Well, we don't really have a toggle voice command. Um, we can either enable the voice or disable the voice. So what we're doing here is toggling a phantom output, and again, I'm showing output 100 in this example. When the F key is pressed, we toggle that output. And then based on that output state and two other rules, we're deciding do we enable the voice when the output is turned on or disable the voice. I said that backwards. So we're disabling the voice when the output's on and enabling it when the output's off. And so that allows us to make that one button perform both of those functions or as a, uh, a toggle on off for the voice. So there's just another example for you. So um, I know that's a, a lot of information on outputs. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, let's go ahead and address those at this time. I do have some questions, Amy. Um, I'm going to go back to the garage door opener slide. Uh, I have a question that says, how does the system know the door is secure? Okay. Um, it's going to know that based on a sensor. So they're, they make uh, garage door sensors that are special door sensors. They're not like the ones that you would have on your normal doors. Um, they're, they're made to deal with the movement of the garage door. And they're also encased so that they can, uh, you know, they can be run over by a car without damage. So you get a special um, door sensor for your garage door that gets tied to an input to the M1. In this example, it was tied to zone 3. And that's how we know whether or not the door is open. Thank you. And then um, can the zone temp sensor, uh, when we were talking about the temperature sensors, um, can the zone temp sensor work in any of the first 16 zone inputs? Any of the first 16 zone inputs, yes, that's correct. So any main board zone, um, whether that's going to be the first 16 on an M1 Gold or the first 8 on an M1 Easy 8, um, it, they cannot be connected to input expanders. Okay. So that's a good question. And that, uh, can output 2 be turned off during a water alarm? I um, think we're talking about the would... water shutoff valve. <clears throat> That is something that you, you should handle here, um, and I've hopped over into the LCRP software. You should handle that here in the cutoff timer section. Um, each different type of alarm has a cutoff timer associated with it. Um, that's set in seconds here. So if you don't want to hear the siren for your water alarm, you're going to want to set that to one second. Not zero, but one. You will not hear the siren with it set to one. If you set it to zero, it has some undesirable effects. So set it to one on your cutoff timer, and that's going to keep output one and output two from triggering based on that alarm type. Perfect. Um, I know that we're running out of time, but I do want to mention to everybody, um, we are celebrating our 20th year anniversary. Uh, we Elk started in 1993, and so we're so proud to be in business for 20 years, and we thank you all for supporting us. And to do that, uh, to kick it off, we are doing an Elk Make Me Famous campaign where we want you guys to send us your pictures of your M1 installs, and we'll feature them on our social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. But we're also going to include those in our monthly newsletters and on our website starting in December. So please send us your 
your uh, M1 installs, you can send it to this email, training at elkproducts.com, um, or you can send it to us through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, but it's just a great way to show off your hard work, but we also can promote your business. We can, because we'll include your business name, where you're located, and we've got a lot of um, great feedback from posting those pictures. So please participate in the Make Me Famous campaign that we're going to be doing. And below, you can see that we're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. And if you have any questions whatsoever after this webinar, please email Amy um, when she emails you um, the follow-up email. Definitely email her back with any questions. You can call us. There's our number. And visit us on our website, elkproducts.com. But thank you so much, everybody, for coming and joining with us in our M1 Outputs webinar today. And happy Friday. Happy Friday, everyone, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Amy. Bye, everybody.